You've now had the chance to participate in some informative sessions, information that I hope you will take back with you and integrate into some of your activities at home. I know that as I've moved about today, I think I just told you, I've heard interesting conversations that have given me some ideas for considerations in the future. I just sat through a session on elder abuse and we actually listened as to ideas from you all and it was a huge, huge help to me and I'm, I'm texting during it and I'm not really texting, I'm texting myself because I'm sending myself notes of things that I hear. So I don't forget when I get back that we need to follow up or make sure that we take your ideas and go forward with them. Um, those of you that heard me earlier might have recalled that I had said we have great partners, and we do. Some in other federal agencies, but we also have great supporters in our aging stakeholder network. One such individual is here with us this afternoon. And many of you, I watch people walking up to him, hugging him and saying, Bob, Bob, is Bob Lincato. I've only known Bob over the past couple years as my 10 year senior core director, but you know, in that time, I've come to fully understand what a long time supporter he has been of senior core. He has deep roots in our network with more than 30 years of service in aging and public service and is currently the executive director of the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Program, NANASP. It would take me the rest of this session to really tout, tout, talk about, list, read even, all of his accolades, so I'm just gonna name a few. He has participated in four, get that, four, White House conferences on aging, including having served as executive director and has been the chair of the American Society on Aging. He is the former president of the National Committee on the Prevention of Elder Abuse and is currently the national coordinator for the Elder Justice Coalition. He was named by Next Avenue as one of the top 50 influencers in, the, in aging. And those of you who were at our 2018 convening may recall that I told you that he was also knighted by the Republic of Italy. On September 1st, he will begin a four-year term as the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services, appointed by Secretary Azar of HHS. And he has won numerous awards for advocacy, most recently winning the National Hispanic Council on Aging's 2018 President's Award that was awarded in December of 2018, and the Rhoda Jennings Distinguished Older Advocate Award from the Southern Gerontology Society in April of 2019. And you know what? While he might be a knight of Italy, he is, more importantly, a great friend of senior court, Bob Lancato. Well, hello, everybody. Everything was good, except I realized that that last award I got was for being an older advocate. <laughs> I better go back and change that a little bit, because you know, in the field that we're in, we don't call each other old friend. We call each other friends of long standing. Okay, so keep that in mind going forward. Debbie, thank you, uh, not only for the introduction, but um, we do have a great relationship. Um, this woman has taken the reins of this organization and this group and all of you, and does such a great job representing Senior Corps in Washington and around the country. I, my best example, and I'll talk a little about this later, is her work on the Elder Justice Coordinating Council. She came, all these federal agencies come in, you know, and some of them will give you little puff stories about what they, what, what they think they're doing. She goes out there and tells them exactly what they're doing, on the ground, trying to fight elder abuse with Senior Corps people. I remember the day, they, got, they gave you a lot of respect that day, because you gave a great report. So please join me in giving her a well-deserved round of applause for her leadership. All right, let's see, I'm gonna try not to mess up here. Oh, oh, I see it's over there. Oh, I thought it could be over here too, okay. Oh, I brought the wrong glasses today. Oh boy, okay, well, you know what, that's, you know what, in the world of, Presentations, that's why you always print your presentation, so you can actually look at it at the podium. So, um, I want to also thank Jan and Brian for their uh, work on this uh, session. 
Um, I know you've had some important speakers already today, some friends and colleagues of mine, Tony Bacon and, and Lance Robertson. But you know, the thing, your theme remains as relevant today as it ever was before. Mobilizing experience, fostering innovation, and creating impact. That's all good stuff. So let's start with a review of you know, your topic of elder justice and independent living, okay? So in the world of Washington, we always have to start with definitions. You name a piece of legislation you've read about, what's the first thing you read about? It's in definition, right? So what's the definition of independent living? It comes from the Independent Living Institute. And the key words there, of course, are making informed decisions to direct one's own life and having ability of information, financial resources, and peer group support systems. Independent living is a dynamic process. It can never be static, unquote. Then let's take a definition of elder justice that came from the Elder Justice Act of 2010. It is about, from a society level, efforts to prevent, detect, treat, intervene in, and prosecute elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and protect elders with diminished capacity while maximizing their autonomy. From an individual perspective, elder justice is defined as the recognition of an elder's right, including the right to be free of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. What we say is elder justice is achieved when elder abuse is prevented. So to simplify, elder justice is in fact essential to achieving independent living for an older adult. You cannot be independent if you fear for your physical safety. You can't be independent if you rely on others for care and end up being neglected and or abandoned. You can't be independent if your assets fall into the hands of a scammer or a corrupt family member. And let me ask this question. How many people in this room have received a robocall in the last two days? Raise your hand. Okay? This is our big new issue. Okay? And I'll give you a funny story that a senator from New Jersey, anybody from New Jersey here? I don't know. Okay. I know you may have heard the story. Senator Menendez was doing a press conference on new legislation he was introducing to fight robocalls, and he got a robocall during the press conference. So most of you know that you know, these, these statistics are relatively common. One in 10 older adults will be abused. And recent research suggests those rates are increasing. Because remember, it's about reporting cases. Because every case that happens, there are five more that happen that, don't go on, that are unreported. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the rate of assault on American men, 60 and over, increased 75% from 2002 to 2016. And the rate of assault on women increased 35%. And just using the state of Massachusetts, their executive office of elder affairs had a 40% increase in reported cases since 2015. So this is why the fight goes on to get a stronger federal response to the growing problem of elder abuse in America. This is why I've spent 15 years of my life working as a national coordinator of the Bipartisan Elder Justice Coalition. And I'm happy to say we're seeing some progress being made on this front. Let me talk about two important current developments. One is, this administration's recognition that elder abuse is a law and order issue. Okay? We have to stop dancing around the fact. If you scam somebody out of their life savings, it's a crime. And so they are committing the resources of law enforcement to crack down on the never-ending network of scammers, such as rounding up over 200 scam artists who had ripped older adults off to the tune of half a billion dollars or most recently, using the resources of the FBI and the Department of Justice in this wonderful name called Operation Brace Yourself, where International Fraud Ring built Medicare out of a billion dollars by billing it for unnecessary medical equipment, mainly back, shoulder, wrist, and knee braces. And then, of course, the scam we all feel, robocalls. We might be smart and fast enough to dismiss them, but some older adults, vulnerable older adults, are not. And that's why the FCC and the FTC are using their resources to crack down. And I think it's important to point out one fact in the elder abuse space. The average victim of elder abuse in this country is an older woman living alone between the ages of 75 and 80. Okay? The Census Bureau says that 47% of all women over 75 now live alone. Okay? So I always say, look, I can tell you all the money that's lost by by elder abuse scams, but let's put it real into a real personal. You're that older woman living alone. You've had any contact in the outside world all day long. At 4 o'clock, the phone rings. Who is it on the other end? A scammer. Congratulations, you just won the Jamaican lottery. 
Send me $300 for processing fees. You get your big check next week. This is what we have to go after and stop. Okay? Another example of progress is ongoing implementation of the Elder Abuse Prevention and Prosecution Act. Uh, Deb, you had Tony here, right? Tony Bacon? Okay. See, Tony probably touched on this, but I, you know, this is great what they've been doing with this law. It's a bipartisan bill. And for those of you who have reached the point of being too cynical, saying, is anything done in this town that's bipartisan? I can tell you the answer is yes. The Elder Abuse Prevention and Prosecution Act was done by Senator Grassley of Iowa and Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut. And they said, we have to step up our game. We have to start putting coordinators on elder justice, not only in the Department of Justice, but in all 94 federal judicial districts around the country. And this is where you come into play. You should be connecting with all those that are local to you and start telling them all the great work that you do, the training of volunteers to work with their peers to prevent elder abuse, training RSVP people to learn about Money Smart and other programs. You can be a tremendous resource to these local coordinators. And our job is to make sure those connections happen. And on the horizon are three other important items in the elder justice space. One is the reauthorization of the Elder Justice Act itself. And here again, Senator Grassley, as chairman of the Finance Committee, has indicated his willingness to sponsor this bill, and we're working with the staff to help get a new bill together. This bill, in very simple terms, how many of you know about Adult Protective Services? You have it in your state, right? Raise your hand. You know about APS? You know they're overworked and understaffed and under-resourced, right? And you also know that they're funded by a block grant called the Social Service Block Grant, which means if a governor thinks adult protective service is important, you'll get money. If they don't, you won't. There are 12 states in this country where you don't get a nickel of money for adult protective services. The Elder Justice Act says a dedicated funding stream is needed for adult protective services. We also need to strengthen the long-term care ombudsman program to deal with nursing home abuse. And we need longer, strong long-term care protections to, grow, to avoid the growing problem of elder abuse in nursing homes. And Brian, I'm going to digress a second. I have already, but you know, he's, he's going to tell me when it's time to go. I went to Senator Grassley's last hearing dealing with nursing home abuse. One of the women that testified was the daughter of a mo of her, whose mother passed away in a nursing home from dehydration, from being left basically alone for nine days. But here's the part of the story that'll make you crazy, like it made me crazy. This nursing home got a five-star rating. Five-star rating, the highest rating from the federal government. There's something wrong. There's a disconnect there, okay? This is what we need to be going after. The Older Americans Act is up this year. Many of you know that. Many of you are involved in their programs. And it has an existing Title VII on vulnerable elder rights protection activities. We expect to see the long-term care ombudsman program strengthened by the Older Americans Act reauthorization. More of an emphasis on elder abuse in Indian country on the reservations. And something that's been long overdue is to get everybody who's working in the Older, older Americans Act trained to help deal with elder abuse. Why shouldn't a home delivered meal provider have a better ability to do a safety check on an older adult? These are the kind of things we should be doing. The third item is funding, and, and honestly, I was hoping I was going to walk up to the podium and be told by Meredith and my staff that they had just finished on the House side marking up their bill for funding for next year, but apparently they're still talking. Our particular ask is on this, uh, these different slides here, but we saw the initial numbers that were given out by the House this, uh, yesterday. They're increasing funding for elder justice, including $2 million in new money to address an issue we brought to their attention in testimony last year. And you may be seeing this in your communities. There is a growing link between elder abuse and opioid abuse, okay? Adult Protective Service people are telling us they're seeing this and these cases are being reported. But the money that's being sent out to deal with opioids is not necessarily going into the communities to APS and people like that. This $2 million will start that process in Washington. The funding for the social service block grant will be continued. The president asked to get rid of that program altogether. Congress said no. So oftentimes, the best way to look at this, look at this number. Here's the chart, okay? The, the chart in the middle is what your current funding level is for all these different programs, okay? And what's the thing that jumps out at you the most from that chart? Yes. Who sees the increase for senior core? Give yourselves a round of applause. That's a good start, right? <laughs> Going from 202 million up to 221 million. And this is, again, this is the way the process works. The House begins the process. The Senate must do their own bill. They must reconcile, send it to the president for a signature. 
But, you know, it's like playing poker. There's a great poker game called high low, right? You know, if you don't start high, you ain't going to go very far. This was all about starting high. I'll give you my, my favorite example that I've spent a lot of time working on. If this bill holds up, for the first time in history, the Older Americans Act nutrition programs will have a billion dollars in funding for the first time in history. Those of you involved in that program, give, let's hear about that, right? And this, my slides will be available, this chart will be available, so um, if you're not capable of memorizing it on spot, uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. But you know, beyond elder justice, we need to look at other linkages when we spoke, focus on independent living for older adults. The linkage between nutrition and health and independent living. The li linkage between livable communities, villages, and independent living. Transportation and independent living. The overlooked service in our federal system. The proper training of caregivers is important to independent living. The importance of expanding preventative health programs under Medicare to promote independent living. And the importance of financial literacy to independent living. But we also need to focus on the threats to independent living, such as the linkage between opioid abuse and, uh, and elder abuse. On the nutrition front, the threat of malnutrition You've all spent time talking about hunger in seniors and food insecurity in older adults. One out of every two older adults are at risk of malnutrition. We're now getting our arms around this topic and trying to get new resources in to deal with that. The threat of isolation and loneliness, and you people are so important to that fight. Your daily contact with people may avert them from being isolated and lonely. You could never underestimate the value of that contact that you have on a daily basis especially in this environment. The threat of weakening the safety net for the most vulnerable. You know, we can't afford to have cuts to those programs that are serving the poorest in our country. And of course, the threat of homelessness and the lack of affordable housing, which I pretty much every community that sitting in this room has this issue, I'm sure. So as this year progresses, some of the actions that could take place to bolster programs that can help promote independent living. We should be able to renew the Older Americans Act on a bipartisan basis and allow it to fulfill its mission to keep older adults independent and aging with dignity. We should see, we could see, an expansion of Medicare. We're not going to see Medicare for all, I can tell you that. You can take that to the bank. But you may see Medicare for more before this year is over. A buy-in ability for people 50 to 64 to get into Medicare. We're going to see greater expansion of home and community-based services under Medicaid. And what does that mean? For the first time in history in this country, we are spending more on home and community-based services and Medicaid than we are on institutional care for the first time in history. That is worthy of a round of applause. That's very important work. When we start talking infrastructure, we ought to be as big and bold as we can be. It's not the dollar amount, it's where you put the money. Okay, it's more than bridges and highways. It's about more localized transportation options in communities, more affordable housing, more funding to modernize senior and community centers. This is what we need to be doing. So if this conversation goes anywhere, we'll be at the table arguing for these kinds of things. And then finally, the money for the billions in opioids should go into community-based programs. So looking around this room, as it was last year, I had such a good time here last year. I'm, I'm, I've had conversations ongoing with people since last year. You're a wonderful site to look at because of what you do and, what you, and how you do it. And it's all about the ability to reaffirm the work that you do and how important it continues to be. And I never do this. I never do this in speeches. But last year I used the line, I loved it. You loved it. I'm going to say it again. America does not run on Duncan. It runs on volunteers, okay? So I want to... And I wrote to a guy from Duncan Donuts and I said, you know, uh, I said this line, so I was hoping that we might get him to be a sponsor somewhere, but it hasn't worked out yet. <laughs> Anyway, you keep running, you keep doing that work, you keep running the volunteers, and keep making that difference, and thank you for inviting me. I really am happy to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. 
Now we're going to move into the panel part of today's discussion. Uh, the way this will work is Bob will come back up here in just a minute. We're, we're having him get his work out today, coming up and down these steps. And he will be asking a few questions to some of your esteemed colleagues, some senior core program directors who are recommended to us for their unique perspective or experience or programs that touch on our core themes of independent living and elder justice. And then if there's time, we'll also have a little bit of time to uh, do what we call a deconstructed panel and give you all a chance at your seats to talk about those issues as well, answer some of the same questions, share your thoughts at some microphones that you see in the crowd, and ask questions as well. So hopefully this will start to get pretty interactive as we go throughout the session here, and as five o'clock gets closer and we all start to dream of our happy hours or whatever we have planned next. <laughs> But first, it is my honor to introduce four of your colleagues who are all outstanding uh, in their own ways to join this conversation about these two critical issues for Senior Corps and so many of your communities. We're gonna go in alphabetical order and I'll just ask them to come on up and just sit starting to my left as I introduce them. We're gonna start with Kristen Fox. Oh, one more note, uh, if you could hold any applause till we get everybody up here just for the sake of time. Kristen began working for Senior Companions of South Dakota in January 2002 as a program coordinator, and she accepted the role of executive director in 2008. It is a statewide program with 60 volunteers serving primarily in eastern and western South Dakota. The Evangelical Lutheran Good Samaritan Society has been the sponsor of their Senior Corps grant for the past 41 years. She's involved in her community by serving for Project CAR. Do you spell it out or do you just say Project C-A-R? CAR, Project CAR, a coordinated transportation service, on the Advisory Council for Good Samaritan Society Home Health Agency in Sioux Falls, and as a member of the Advisory Council for Better Together, a senior program sponsored by Lutheran Social Services. She's also a member of the Sioux Falls Council on Aging. In 2008, she was appointed to serve on the National Senior Corps Association Board and is the North Central representative for, South, or for the Senior Companion Program and serves on the Senior Companion and Development Committees. Next up, we have Aaron Globerman. Aaron. Aaron is the Director of Senior Corps at Catholic Charities in Southwestern Ohio. He has worked with the RSVP, Foster Grandparent, and Senior Companion programs, all three, for over three years. He previously worked at Riley Hospital for Children at Indiana University Health for 11 years as Volunteer and Guest Relations Coordinator. His career has uh, been, in, or he has been involved in volunteer management throughout his career. Next, we have Josefina Mata. Josefina is the executive director of Concilio CDS, a 501c3 nonprofit organization in New Mexico that has some program components running statewide. She has experienced working with underserved populations and has focused on various national and transnational initiatives. Overall, she has over 30 years of experience in administering healthcare, civic engagement, senior core programs, including all three senior core programs. We love to see this too, AmeriCorps Legacy, AmeriCorps Vista, and many, many, many other types of programs. They have been focused on capacity building and equity around hunger, poverty, health, advocacy, and veteran and military assistance, and social justice by integrating an intergenerational approach. Finally, someone you all had a chance to, to meet, uh, perhaps virtually, a little bit earlier today. We have Teresa Strong, you might recognize from her Elder Justice video. <laughs> Teresa's professional passion has always been enriching the lives of older adults. She started her career in Clovis, New Mexico, a funny connection between some of our uh, panelists, at the age of 19, administering the Senior Companion Program. As uh, she was saying up in the green room, she feels like her career has come full circle now, working with RSVP. She stayed in this position for two years, and in 1988, she moved back to Connecticut, where she, she was hired as the Senior Center and Human Services Director for the town of Cromwell, Connecticut. She served in this capacity for 25 plus years, serving not only senior citizens, but also low-income adults, families, and disabled residents within the community. As the department head, she directed a multi-dimensional human services division that included a senior center, food pantry, and dial-a-ride transportation center. She also serves as a board member of the National Senior Corps Association in Washington, D.C., the Connecticut Commission on Community Service, and as president of CSCA, the Connecticut Senior Corps Association. Can we give our panelists a huge round of applause? Okay, and with that, I'd like to invite Bob back up here to facilitate our conversation. Well, hello again. So I forgot to say two things when I was up here. One is Happy Older Americans Month. Okay, I mean, that's that's an important thing. And Debbie, as I'm walking out of my office, what comes across? I'm just going to read the, the first paragraph. A new report 
shows Senior Corps provides the access, structure, and financial support for low-income, at-risk Americans 55 and old to live happy, healthier and happier lives while making a difference in their community. Put out today to, for the whole world to see from the Corporation for National Service. So, round of applause for yourselves. Here you are. You got, you got a shout out today that I was able to get just before I walked out of my, uh, my office. So, Kristen, let's start with you and the topic of elder justice. Okay, let's try. Everybody's mic on? Let's do a mic test here, make sure. Mic test. Okay. There it is. You guys gotta know where it's. You wanna go do re me, you know, yeah. down the line? Do re me. So, can you tell us more why you think the topic of elder justice, in fact, is important, and how have you addressed it in your program? Uh, it's very important. Um, just from the information we received today, it's, it's not new news. Um, there's scams out there that um, seniors have been taken advantage of. Um, we um, invite the uh, person, Jody Gillespie, that is the fraud in the fraud, consumer fraud division of the state attorney's general's office in South Dakota. She does amazing outreach. She goes all over the state and she comes to our in-service at least once a year. We have three different areas. We're a statewide program. And um, she tells of all the latest scams and the things that are going on out there. And um, this then is absorbed by our companions, but then disseminated to the clients they serve. So um, it's just one more way of getting the word out what's out there. In fact, we just current last year or last week found out from two of our companions that they were part of the social security um, right. scam that's going on. So, um, yeah, the more people are aware of things, the better. That's you know, and you can't emphasize that point enough. I mean, the one basic thing: the federal government never calls you. Okay, the IRS never calls you. Social Security doesn't call you, you know, I mean, just, just think that out every time that comes about. And um, let me ask uh, Aaron, so can you tell us about how you've incorporated an evidence-based program into your work? So our program has worked with Powerful Tools for Caregivers, which is an evidence-based program. It is a series of six sweet classes for caregivers to better take care of themselves so they can take better care of their care receivers. What sometimes happens, unfortunately, is caregivers will take so good care of their care receivers that they die first. And, you know, that's a horrible thing. And, you know, with independent living and all of that, and especially with older caregivers, they need to take care of themselves as they're taking care of their care receivers. Mm -hmm. What we found in our foster grandparent and senior companion programs when we started this program is that our volunteers were caregivers and we didn't even realize it. And I'm not talking about to their clients, I'm talking about to their family or with um, our volunteers, we also see a lot of kinship care. And this program has a model for children with special needs as well. So there was a lot of connection that we were able to make within our program. And what, are you seeing any, any growth in the grandparents raising grandchildren in your areas? So our agency is partnering with local school districts and along with Senior Corps to provide this training because there's a lot of grandparents that are raising their grandkids. Mm -hmm. One training we did, there was a great grandparent raising her grandchild, and she had raised their parents. Wow, that's I've never that's the first time I've heard. Josefina, I think we talked about this a little upstairs. Uh, can you say more about why transportation is important, and how do you handle it in your program? Well, um, I'm from New Mexico, and you see that uh, New Mexico is a very large state. A very, a very rural state. So one of the challenges that we see um, is that transportation is an issue. Uh, and because of that, we see a lot of mobility problems. Uh, many of our seniors, because of uh, having limited access to services, uh, do not have uh, the adequate you know, healthcare services uh, or, uh, you know, or, or they're in isolation because of transportation issues, just being that by itself. Uh, they feel by themselves and many seniors within the communities that we serve in rural New Mexico do not have a car. Uh, sometimes they do rely on others uh, for transportation. 
uh, and many of them as well, because we border, you know, we're in the communities in southern New Mexico where we border with uh, the U.S. and Mexico border. We share like 53 miles uh, of distance, and so this is another issue that we see along with the transportation, uh, you know, adding the language barrier. Uh, we do see a lot of those challenges. And what we do in New Mexico, what we do with Concilio CDS, um, what we have done in really focusing on the independent living and as well as uh, preventing fraud and abuse, uh, we have embedded uh, through Concilio an intergenerational pro approach to all the senior volunteer programs. You know, through the foster grandparents, senior companion, RSVP, uh, as well as that we have um, motivated the community at large to become involved. You know, the idea is very simple, uh, but it focuses on reciprocity. It focuses on helping each other, on building community at the most basic level. Uh, we feel that everybody has something to share. Everybody has a talent. And within that, when it comes to transportation, uh, we feel uh, that people are, you know, when they get involved, they just need people to be asking, uh, will you volunteer uh, help and provide th this transportation to a medical doctor, you know, to a doctor's appointment, to buy groceries. So this is something that we have done and we have uh, people of all ages volunteering, you know, our youngest volunteer that I would say uh, it's two years old and our oldest volunteer, it's uh, 96 years old. And within that, th you know, that interreaction that they get from, uh, from being with each other, it has really helped. Uh, and by building this, um, we have uh, developed a social network within the community where we've been making the connections with, with the community themselves, you know, people connecting people. Now uh, that we're not so much connecting people, but people already know each other, they, so they have been fostering friendships, they've been developing and becoming part of their own families. Um, some of the examples, like I mentioned before, in regards to transportation, we have people volunteering to provide transportation, uh, taking people uh, to the doctor, providing in-service trainings, uh, and people on the receiving end, those clients who are uh, receiving services through one of our uh, senior volunteer programs, uh, they're also involved, and if they have mobility problems, not so much that they can you know, move around, but they are part of contributing. You know, they make phone calls to other seniors, you know, who might be by themselves as well. Others crochet scars for other volunteers who are helping out in the community. Uh, and it's basically through that collaboration. I know that my colleagues mentioned here uh, that collaboration is uh, it's critical here. And what we do at Concilio, we go to the community. Uh, we don't wait for the community to come to us because this is, you know, critical uh, in working in the field of the senior core programs. Uh, we go beyond the matching of volunteer with volunteer stations. Yep. And so transportation is one, you know, one thing. And I just want to say that, um, uh, as I was mentioning before to Ms. Debbie Cos Rush, um, that I am very excited for the, I know it's in the early stages, but the CNCS Transformation and Sustainability Plan, because I do see that this is really going to be helping us in the community in the field, because it's going to be building sustainability. It's going to give us an opportunity for all of us to innovate and to find those uh, answers to what we're doing. So when we talk about transportation, it really transcends into other areas as well. So Teresa, I know you have a perspective on the role of evidence in senior core work and in the field of elder justice generally. I'd like to hear a little about that and also you have some unique program with your state attorney general. Can you share thoughts on both of those? Sure. Oh, make sure yours is on. And by the way, my apologies to the group over here. Uh, Maybe a little difficult to to hear, but you'll be called on first for questions from the audience, okay? 
Okay, so I don't know how many of you saw the video early, but we are fortunate enough in the state of Connecticut, we have our RSVP program partnering with the Attorney General's Office, where we have several volunteers that work at our Consumer Advocacy Unit of the Attorney General's Office, helping on the front lines to investigate claims of financial exploitation of seniors. Um, I hear back from the volunteers, which you've heard on the video, that it is the most rewarding opportunity for them, but more importantly, I think the most important thing is that it's much easier for a senior to talk to another senior. Just like we like talking to each other as peers and finding out what's going on out there. I think that's why our program works so well. Um, and I know a lot of you are listening and you're thinking, ah, could I do that in my community? Um, I had one um, colleague in another part of the country after the video said to me, well, I'm five hours from our Attorney General's office. I think it's important to remember that there's other partners out there. The Attorney General's office works great for us and I'd like to see that. And I loved when Debbie said that to the Assistant Attorney General that we wanna model this all over the country. That's great. But you could also do local community partnerships, whether it's with your state sheriff's office, your ombudsman, um, your social services offices, whatever, where you could get senior volunteers in there working and helping the fight, because it's a fight that needs to be, we need to keep it up. Um, and working with the elderly for 25 years, that as well as transportation has been a passion of mine. I think just hearing the reporting statistics and knowing that there are so many, if you look at that amount of money that they were scammed out of, and that was only one in 44, I believe it was, that was reported, think about that. That could be you know, your relative. So I think it's really critical. And i putting myself out there. Anyone that is interested and wants to see how we do our program, I will provide you. You could cherry pick all you want from any of my documents, and I will help you get the program up and running because it's, it's a very worthwhile program. That, that's important because then I'm going to go back to a point, and I don't know whether Tony brought this up or not, but at some point when those 94 elder justice coordinators in the federal judicial district are all named, you know, they're going to be people that you should know uh, and be able to make connections. If you're already doing the work on the ground, they're coming in new. You should be the ones that, you know, tell them what to do, basically, right? So. Now I'm gonna ask an audience question before we go to the next round of questions. How many people in this room are baby boomers? Raise your hand. And how many of you are in denial about aging? Raise your hand. <laughs> That's the secret to why you're good advocates for older people today, see? <laughs> Keep that in mind. Um, Kristen, you know, we talked about transportation, and it's a very important issue, and I'm, you may have some things to add. And I'm gonna to say to everybody, the first round, we usually get your own question. The second time around, we'll get another question, but if you, anybody said something that interests you from your panel, if you wanna to react to, feel free. But let's go back to transportation, and uh, what do you wanna to add to that from your perspective? Um, our state is, is rural and even frontier in areas. And transportation is a huge need, even in the largest city of 200,000. Um, we currently have 80 people waiting for a senior companion just in Sioux Falls, the largest community. Out in the Black Hills, we have over 50 on a waiting list. And we have one, um, I mean, it, it's crucial to folks for our companions to provide that transportation and um, we have one gal down in way down in south uh, western south dakota and she has like i think five or six clients that depend on her it's a very small isolated community and the local uh, shop coat just closed and so now they have to travel even further just to even get to a grocery store mm -hmm. or get to a Walmart. So um, it's, um, yeah. You, want, you need more. Mm. You need more. We need more companions, yeah. Well, I need companions, <laughs> yeah. And, but think about that. When you start hearing the word infrastructure being bounced around, you know, a, a big new initiative that may get bipartisan support. Well, we have got to do our part to drill that down to enhancing transportation services at all local levels, because that is really critical for the independence of older adults. Aaron, any thoughts on transportation? The, the one thought I have is 
you know, more funds for senior companions because we always have a waiting list. We always have the need for transportation. And our problem is we have so many bus riders that are senior companions trying to find those that are willing to drive and willing to provide that transportation is a, challenging, a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. And I know, Josefina, you have talked about transportation. How do you handle it in your program? You've got a lot of all kinds of different areas that you focus on. What, what, what works the best from your perspective? Uh, well, the, what works best besides connecting people, and as I was mentioning, making the connections with people through our collaborators, building partnerships with other people that can provide that transportation for our seniors. And I do agree with the rest of the panel, we do have a long waiting list of people uh, needing the service, but if uh, I think that's something that resonates with me, it's uh, the importance of building partnerships within our communities right. because everybody has something to offer and all of us can benefit and then we can also provide that. Right. Teresa, any thoughts on the same thing? Well, as I mentioned earlier, transportation's always been a passion of mine and running a dial-a-ride for 25 years, I would always feel so badly when we couldn't do that particular ride. Um, as many of you know, I think pretty much throughout the country, most municipal dial-a-rides are curb to curb. And very often you have that senior that needs that door-to-door -door or door-through-door -door service, and we just couldn't accommodate. And I think that's where you saw a lot of the transportation paid services come up and sprout out all over the country that were out there, and even wonderful um, nonprofit ones like ITN. Um, but a lot of them have come and gone. And so my goal with RSVP, what we've done, is we have a volunteer medical transportation program. And my main focus was to make sure that we were augmenting what was in the communities that we were serving. I did not want to duplicate. So um, my Sicilian comes out a little bit, and when people call for rides, I make sure first they've called the senior center, and it's not something that the senior center can accommodate. We want to make sure we're not duplicating what's being done out there. I think that's very important when you're collaborating um, with corporation, municipality, whoever you're working with out there as partners, you don't want to be stepping on toes. You want to make sure you're augmenting and providing services together. So we've done since 2016, I think this is our third year, we've done over 2,000 one-way rides with about 20 drivers. And we're really proud of that and helped probably almost 100 um, individuals. And we've done that all with um, receiving only $4,000 a year through AAA funding. And um, I'm happy to report that this year we actually um, obtained um, in the thousands from private donations as well as two municipalities in our state have come aboard and, and made donations to help us. So we're in six communities where we started in three in just a three year period. It's a wonderful program. And again, if anyone wants any information, I know some of you do transportation programs out there. And the one thing I would say to you is make sure you're not duplicating. Make sure you're really filling that hole um, that exists that for the seniors that aren't getting the transportation and not just providing another variety of it. Thank you. I see Brian standing up there, which means we may be moving to the audience perspective of things. Now, do you want to take that part or do you want me to do it? Uh, well, if it's okay, I was actually going to invite our audience here to reflect on a couple of questions first and then sure. come back with, with questions and answers. All right. uh, we know Don't that- Don't forget the, the people over here. They get, they get to go first. Okay. They get to go first. I got you. I see you. Uh, we know we've got four wonderful Senior Corps program directors up on stage, but we know they're not the only ones. We know you all have interesting thoughts and experiences and perspectives to share. So what we're going to do is briefly ask you to consider a couple of questions at your table. Um, before we do that, I want to do one question to all of you just as a show of hands. How many of you feel like transportation is an important issue in your community? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Almost, almost everyone. I shouldn't say good. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, 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 that's interesting. Some of you may be wondering how, how it came up here in this uh, topic uh, of independent living. And it was through organic conversations with our panelists. It just emerged as something that was on everybody's mind. And, and I don't think I need to explain the connection to the, uh, between those two. So I'm going to invite you to do is consider one of two questions just to the people near you. And you can choose which one you want to think about. And we'll just give you five to seven minutes to discuss it. The first is what role do you see your program playing in the field of elder justice? You can see that up on the slide right now. And the second, I'm actually going to ask our, our slide of answer to skip through to the third question, which is, 
let me see if I have it here, is transportation a common issue in your community? What innovative approaches have you seen to this issue? So again, question one, what do you see your program's role in the field of elder justice being? And question three, is transportation a common issue in your community? What innovative approaches have you seen? Go ahead, take five to seven minutes, just discuss that among yourselves, and then we'll come back together and you can share reflections and ask questions of our panelists and, and I think Bob as well. All right, go ahead. Oh my goodness. Wow. Dinner is served. They gave me a new toy. Okay, let's go ahead and bring it back. Let's go ahead and bring it back. Shh. Don't make me clap. You guys know. You guys know I can do that. All right. All right. Now we'll go ahead and we'll have our Q&A, but we want you to also share your reflections and your thoughts. You know, it's pretty common, I think, to go to a panel and some people come up and they have questions, but their questions are really comments. That's okay here, that's what we want. We want both questions and comments. So you can just stand up and get in line between, behind one of these two microphones if you wanna share a reflection or a question. Go ahead and just stand up now, right now, you don't need to wait. Your invitation is now to stand up if you have a question or a comment. And while you're waiting, I'm gonna ask one more audience question. I can't resist doing this because you're all from mostly out of town. How many people in this room have either shaken their head or their fist at Washington in the past year? Thank you very much for that. Okay, go on, carry on, carry on. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and we'll start over there. Alicia Ross, uh, Program Director in Pensacola, Florida, Sugar White Sands, come on down. And uh, <laughs> we have FGP, SCP, and a state program called Relief, which is exactly like SCP. And having this co uh, conversation with our colleagues over here, Memphis, Tennessee, and in Arizona, um, just surprised at how blessed we are in Florida and Pensacola in the Northwest that we do not have an issue with transportation. We have a contract with the county and they provide transportation for our, any of our clients, uh, our um, consumers, any of our volunteers. And we are already very proactive with addressing elder issues and elder justice, but in talking with them and finding out that there's one that has a sponsor that has a problem with their seniors um, providing transportation for the clients and as well as it being a transportation issue in Arizona for their volunteers as well. So just kind of wanting to have some of us get together and maybe brainstorm how we can help each other navigate these things. I'm here to, to help anyone uh, talk to your communities about how they can help you provide transportation. So I think those of us who are really blessed and don't have some of these issues, we really need to jump in and help some of the others who do not, who do have these issues. So we wanna make sure that we're doing that while we're networking. Who's next, who's next? We don't want shy people here, come on. This is important. I have never referred to senior core program directors as shy. Uh, no, I have neither. Come on, guys. My recollection okay, is Okay, here we go. Because I heard a lot of buzzing at those tables, so something must have been talked about. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. In the state of California, the California Department of Corporations, which is the state agency that licenses people who sell financial products, they about maybe 12 years ago contracted with RSVP programs throughout the state to do a program called SAFE, S-A-I-F, which was Seniors Against Investment Fraud. And what they, what they had RSVP programs doing was training volunteers to go out in the community to give presentations about how to protect yourself from investment fraud. Well, the economy went south, <laughs> and so did the program. So we are not contracted to do that anymore. But I will say in my county, the, a measure was um, thrown out to the voters about four years ago. Um, one half of 1% of our sales tax goes towards funding a specific person in our um, Aging and Adult Services, APS, to do exactly what the SAFE program was doing statewide, 
but this is just in our county. So we have one dedicated person who do goes out and gives education about elder abuse prevention. Thank you for that. Any comments from the panel on that? Anybody have thought on that? I mean, that's, that's a great program, and uh, yes. The only thing I would add is that that's a good example of something we're going to try to do in Connecticut and taking our volunteers that are attorney generals a step further and having them go out and do education in the community. And when you're saying you're having one person, my thought process would be what better than to have RSVP volunteers going out in the community and talking peer to peer, whether they're sitting in a community center, a senior center, or wherever, hearing another senior talk about it and potentially maybe how they had been a victim of fraud it, it's going to make it so much more easier for more of those people to come forward and really report and like we talked about earlier today report 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 that's what has to be done so that we can get a handle on it right. and it is not rocket science in the sense that the people closest to the older people should be the best authorities to deal with this issue uh, you know you don't have to invent it you're out there you're doing it and you know the more the more that's done you know, the more you see, you know, with elder abuse, you can't stop what you don't report, okay? And that's the responsibility that everybody has, and I think it's, it's good that we do that. I think we have time for one more question or comment, if anyone would like to join the conversation. One more question or comment, here we go, thank you. Well, it, it's, I guess, uh, more of a, a comment than a, than a question, but uh, back home in Sacramento, California, my senior companion program really does focus a lot on transportation. Uh, it focuses there because that's what the community asks for. It, it's a lot easier ask for a senior to say they need a ride than it is for them to say that they're isolated and lonely. Um, and, and we respond to that in kind. And even though Sacramento is really much more of an urban area than a rural area, we have a lot of the same kind of issues with regards to transportation, which is why it comes up. Um, but that also means that for my program, it's really important that I recruit seniors that have transportation, that have a car, that have a reliable uh, car. And you know, I, I can't help but think that it would be a lot easier for me to do some of that recruitment if our stipend was raised even a little bit to help with that uh, effort <laughs> to uh, keep your car running while you're helping your other fellow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so anyway. Thank you for that comment. So um, so if that was the last question, then I guess you should join me in thanking Kristen, Teresa, Aaron, and Josefina for being the great panelists that they were. So please thank them for. <laughs> and if you were too shy to ask questions um, on things outside your table and something that came up, yeah, uh, somebody. I know, oh, I know you're not shy. Hello, how are you? Good to see you again. Yes. Right, right. you need to be near a microphone though. Even though you make think you project. You, and by the way, thank you for having more yeah. questions on this side than this side. <laughs> I really don't have a question. I have a highlight. Um, transportation was um, one of the critical needs in the community in southwest Georgia. We serve 14 counties, and transportation was terrible. We have rural areas that there are dirt roads. They have no, they had, they had no transportation. Now they have transportation. We started with a four per month free. Now we're up to six. Reason being because there was a lot of dialysis patients out there and they really needed to go to the doctor with no transportation. So they get six free rides. And I want to highlight my volunteer. He uh, walked in the office and said, I needed something to do. And I uh, recruited him. So he's my coordinator. He comes in every day, five days a week, 930 to 430. And he's the co coordinator, and he makes all the trips every day. And that is a full-time job. Thank you. And i leave you with this. We recognize him. Um, he's bought transportation now. Excellent. Thank you. You know, I, I was tempted to say to you that what you should do is go to, over to Augusta National and tell them to let them have some of those golf carts out there and use them for some good transportation for some local things. 
I mean, they're not used every day, right? So, you know. Um, well, Brian? I think that's it. If everybody could just join me in giving both Bob and our fantastic panelists a round of applause. Thank you.